What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This podcast is powered by Stick and Ball TV, the baseball and softball streaming platform. If you're a coach and you're looking for a resource to help you get better, then Stick and Ball is just for you. With weekly updated videos from some of the best baseball and softball coaches in the country, it's a no-brainer. Check them out at stickandball.tv or on the Stick and Ball TV mobile app. For today's episode, we have on Texas A&M hitting coach Michael Early and the University of Arizona hitting coach Toby DeMello. Both of their fall episodes were some of the most downloaded for the entirety of 2021. But today, we're looking at in-season. So we go over how do we get ready in the preseason, what we go about for game planning, and how to help players develop an approach. Here is Michael Early and Toby DeMello. What changes with uh, with the preseason focus? So let, you, you've outlined a lot of the training aspects that you guys are doing. I'm sure we're only scratching the surface. But what is what a, when you, do you flip a switch whenever you get to a certain point in the year? And do you uh, what do you do with that? I mean, yeah. I mean, once you get into the season, I mean, the unfortunate part is like you, you can't ever stop developing players, but you obviously got to give a little more time to. The, there's only a, a few guys that you know are playing every single day and the rest of the guys are com- competing. So the challenging part is still putting in the time with the guys who aren't playing because you know what, you might need them later in the year, or next year. And that's actually just, you know, as a coach, you, you, it's just really, it feels good when you, when you work with a guy and he doesn't play that much, but then he gets in, he gets a big hit and you're like, you know what, like you put in all that time, just for that one AB and that kid put in all that work and he, and he had success, but the, the switch definitely flips from the one thing that doesn't flip is our cage routine. Like we'll stay a cage routine pre-practice will always be about perfect mechanics, doing things the right way, having the right approach. And that's, that's your time to talk and, and work through those things. But when you get in game, especially in competition, like you have to throw a lot of that out the window and just compete. And and, tr- and trust what you've done. Trust that keeping it simple works. Trust that, you know, having an approach of staying in the middle of the field and trying to drive baseballs that way works. And it just it's it's less time in practice to talk about mechanical adjustments on the field just because you're playing a game so much. Like you might only have two practices a week. So you really got to do that stuff in the cage. And then when you get out on the field, you got to flip that switch to compete mode. And I think that's something that, I want to say it's it's not lost in our game, but at the end of the day, like I think the best players of all time, the best best hitters of all time, when it comes down to it, they they out compete people. Like they outwork people in the box, they out compete people, and they they trust their routine, they trust the mental side of it. They're really good with controlling their breaths, and they and they don't get sped up. So it's something that definitely changes. I'm not sure to exactly articulate it, but you know what I mean, like. There's way more anxiety and, and go when, when you're playing in games. Like, that's just the truth of it. Like, I'm not going to be as calm in season as I am in the fall. Uh, internally, on the outside, I feel like I do a good job of, of keeping that face. But the truth is, it's it's different. Like, you know, there's winners and, you know, we say there's winners and learners. But inevitably, on a piece of paper, there's winners and losers. And that definitely controls the mood. No doubt. No doubt. So one of the next things that I want to really go over with, you talked about pre-pitch routines and you guys installing those. Uh, if if they're getting to the season without those, I think that, that we're missing the boat. But I would love to hear j- your process on what you guys are teaching, uh, how you guys are making it, you know, making it their own. But once they get into the box, it's a it's a simple process for them. So you talk, so you mentioned the breath, which which kind of triggered that for me. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know pre pitch routines, how to get guys ready once they step in the box. It's compete time. Yeah, it's just we you know it, it's as simple as you got a guy in the box, you got a guy on deck, you got a guy in in the in the hot seat, and you got a guy, a fourth guy. And you know, coaches think the big thing is you know you're at bat starts when you put those batting gloves on, and you're at bat ends when you take the batting gloves off, and it's just it's as simple as you're not just running up on deck when it's your turn on deck. You know what I mean? Like you are, you are locked in when you're in that, that third seat, like you're working your timing then and you'll see videos of our guys 
there's a guy up to bat and there's a guy on deck and it's in there in sync with them. And you see that all the time and people, you know, tweet it and this, that, but like, we actually do it. We actually do it. And then you can even see that third guy, you know, he's in the dugout, but he's doing the same thing. And what's the hardest part about hitting to me is, is timing. Like, why would you not, why would you not try to get as much timing as possible? And, I, again, it's nothing crazy. It's nothing, you know, that other people aren't doing, but it's just making them do it. And o- honestly, it's them them doing it and them having success and knowing it works. And when guys aren't doing it, it's the players like, like hey, man, make sure you're doing your routine and, and, and doing that. And, um, you know, we have, we have a mental performance coach, and I don't want to dive too deep into that because I think it's kind of, you know, it's it's something for us. And I, I think we're doing some stuff on the on the mental side that, no offense. I don't really want to put out there, honestly, because I don't know if it's appropriate just because we, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff we do, but I think anything you do from the mental side, as long as it's nothing crazy and you, and you buy into it, it's, it works. And it's, it's as simple as, you know, you take a, you swing at a bad pitch, whatever, instead of just hopping right back in there, like have a focal point, maybe it's something on your bat. If you watch Aaron judge play, he looks at the left field foul pole, takes a breath and gets back in there. It's just something that's consistent where if you're playing in front of nobody or you're, you're playing at Ole Miss or you're playing at Florida, you're playing in Omaha, that doesn't change, right? The left field foul pole is still in left field. Your breath still your breath. It doesn't matter what's going on. I can go back to that take a look, breathe, and then I'm back to work. So it's it's something I've never done in the past, like, and actually made like a thing. It's just something like, hey, man, you know, make sure you take a breath, find it, find something to look at this, that. But I think when you actually make it, I mean, we make, we make our guys practice it. Like the first day we made them practice that part of it, which was a little bit, it's kind of silly, but it's like, if you, if you don't practice it, then how can you how can you do it? Like, how do you know exactly what to do? And that goes back to coach being an unbelievable, you know, communicator. Like mm-hmm. he says, what, what's, uh, what's to be expected must be defined. And he does really good stuff at the really good job of defining things. And I think it's really helped our players a lot. I love that. So let's, let's, uh, let's talk about game planning. And you mentioned, earlier that you don't want to have the the third inning meeting you know oh, hate him. And, uh, hate him. <laughs> right but you but you guys have access to you know with with all of all of the different information that d1s have uh, yeah. access to a ton of different information game planning i mean you're in, in the sec which even heightens all of that and mm-hmm. so every pitch matters going into a game being on time being ready understanding what you need to do to to have success versus uh, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday guys, which are who are unbelievable and will be, you know, first round picks almost every weekend. But talk to us about, you know, how you're how you go about helping players with that, because there's one side that's like we, we don't want to want to overwhelm them. But then the other extreme would be, well, we want them to make sure that they're prepared from pitch one, because that may be the best pitch that we get the entire A.B. So how do you balance that? Walk us through what you can uh, w- within that, and and let's uh, let's rep- let's riff on that for a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, if in D one baseball and and even junior college now, like you, you, everyone has a synergy scouting system, which can show you everything you need to see, and can show you honestly way too much. And it's about mm-hmm. picking out what's good and bad. And um, guy I used to work for uh, work with Jason Kelly's at LSU now. He, uh, he made a good point to me one time. He's like, you watch it so much. You see a good breaking ball. You see a bad breaking ball. You see an okay breaking ball. So it's like, what do you tell the guys? I'm like, man, that's a good point. Like, I sit here and watch this until I'm about to fall asleep, and I see you see everything. So you really like to just focus on outlier counts, like things they do, 0 0 2 3 one in guys in scoring position, and then really just trying to show them the pitch shape. Like, what is the shape of the pitch? Not necessarily – like, I don't want to – we're going in to face a guy. I don't want to show them video of him just ripping off sliders and guys swinging and missing, swinging and missing, swinging and missing. I'd rather show him, like, hey, here's this guy's pitch shape. Also, here's a percentage of when he throws this in the zone. So, like, I think we're pretty good if we stay on the fastball here. If we see any spin, just take it. Like, 
that is something I've gotten better at. And I think I didn't do a great job in the past. It's like, Hey, here's this guy's slider. Like sometimes he hangs it. Sometimes he buries it. Sometimes it's okay. It's like, yeah, <laughs> duh. Like yeah, it's baseball. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's, you just watch so much of it. You want to try to give them so much information. And I, what I articulate to the guys is this scouting report is great. Like it gives us a little bit of an edge going into the game, but once we're three or four batters in, we don't need it. Like if, if you're the eight hole guy, like in our scrimmage the other day, we had a, you know, smaller left-handed guy leading off. We had a smaller left-handed guy in the seven hole. We had a smaller left-handed guy in the nine hole. And what we talked about was like, you guy in the nine hole, your best scouting report you're going to get is watching the one guy in the one spot and the seven spot Mm -hmm. guy in the seven spot is watching the guy in the one spot. I said, I told the guy in the one spot, I said, just wear it, buddy. Like (laughs) you got to go out there and compete. No, but that's why we have, he gets to go up in an AB and he has somewhat of a clue before he, before he gets in, gets into the box. Like that is just, to me, the scouting report part is from a hitting standpoint, gives you an advantage in the first inning because after the first inning, you should be getting a lot of the information you have unless there's, you know, some extreme stuff or some extreme outlier stuff, but it definitely helps on the defensive part with positioning and things like that. But it's about how much information can we take in and and make it simple for the players. And it's something that you definitely, I feel like I've definitely gotten better at because I think at the beginning, um, it just, just too much info, too much info too quick. And it was, hard to absorb no i appreciate the vulnerability there because i i think that regardless of whether or not we admit it we've all been there especially oh, yeah. with the amount and it, came, it came from a good place like i was i was just putting mm-hmm. into like I, I when i first got that thing i was obsessed with it like i literally couldn't stop watching like this is the most, this is the most mm-hmm. unbelievable thing i've ever seen in my life and it was like just a little too much information where it was like this that like he's got this pitch he'll throw it you know just just keep it simple like Here's the pitch shapes. Here's what they do. Here's some most likely pitches. Here's his number one off-speed pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's only thrown 10 change-ups right on right all year. We're in second to last series of the year. Don't even think about that. You know what I mean? Just sure. instead of like, hey, he has a change-up too. Like there's only one guy. Like I said, I could tell that too. He just had to put it in the back of his mind. But mm-hmm. most people most people aren't that guy. So I doubt. So how do you, with, with communicating pitch shapes, what is that? What does that look like for you? Uh, and are you talking about just showing them what it looks like or trying to simulate it with machines, both, neither? Well, uh, a little bit of both. So, I mean, we did a good job last year. It's a, kind of a crazy stat I, I can pull up, but it kind of kind of shows you. Okay, yeah, to use that. So, like, yeah, showing pitch shapes and preparing. So, you know, last year on Friday nights against 10 Pac-12 pitchers that were first team we hit 330 off of and they had an 8.35 era wow. on friday nights off first team pack 12 guys that had everything to do with like it's like a football game you get to prepare like you don't get to prepare all week for saturday and sunday but if we can take an advantage of friday we're gonna do it and i mean you know you know caleb longley i, I hate to even say his name since he's at texas now but no <laughs> good, good right. friend of mine we, we worked really, 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 really good together and designing that and putting, trying to get accurate spin rates, accurate release points. Did we ever mention that to the players? No. It was like, hey, guys, we're setting up the machine. It's going to be similar to the guy we face on Friday. Like, here's our approach. Let's execute it in practice. Instead of like, hey, the guy over on Friday, you know, his breaking ball spins at this, comes at this angle, fastball spins at 2,200 to 2,500. Like that's stuff they don't need to hear. That's stuff for us. And then we, and then we put it into action. And when I got that sad, I'm like, man, that makes a lot of sense. And then we had a lot of success too. If the Friday and Saturday guy, Saturday guy were similar, um, that helped a lot as well. So it's about kind of showing it to them in practice, if you can, and just on the video showing showing the best you can on the actual shape of the pitch and a good angle. And, and sometimes, again, you just got to go out and compete. But as much information as we can give them, it's better. But no when, when I got that stat, I was like, wow, I mean, that definitely worked. I mean, 330, the 8.35 ERA off the 10 guys, first team all pack 12 on Friday mm-hmm. nights. So, well, you know, I, I love that. And I, I, I wonder how much of that, it helps with confidence too. Cause they've been like, Oh, we've, we've seen this guy for the last, you know, two or three practices. We, we know what he's got. We and know once, what he's, he's going to do. 
Yeah, and once they understand too that like it's not going to be exactly the same, but it's kind of going to give you the same feel. Like the worst of when a guy's like, I mean, it wasn't like that guy's breaking ball. I'm like, okay, man, like, (laughs) like what do you, what do you want? Glad you know. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, thank you. Like it's 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 machine. Okay, that's a person. I I get it. But when they kind of get just the concept and you. You make it more about the approach off the guy and try to make the pitches similar. That's when it helps. Instead of like, hey, this is just like his breaking ball. Like, it's not going to be. It's a machine. But like, hey, here's a breaking ball, fastball, similar to how this guy's is. Here's our approach off it. Let's execute it every single day and, and go at it. And we would do that, like high-speed stuff, and you'd only get three pitches. Instead of doing five rounds of five, we were doing like three rounds of ten. So it's more game like, hey, you hop in there, boom, you're ready to go. Let's go next guy, next guy. And you go through it 10 times instead of five times with longer. So it just, you know, I think Caleb and I made up half the stuff and we were walking to the field and it, it just kind of worked out. So it was oh, good. That's great. Well, I know you've got a, got a run for a meeting here pretty soon. And, man, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed the conversation. I lo- look forward uh, to more of them. But uh, I, I do want to, you know, let you leave the guests with just anything and everything that, uh, what, what has been the biggest impact on you as a coach, with it, whether that's advice, whether that's a book? And if there are any listeners who are listening to you, you know, for the first time, maybe the only time ever, what do you want to leave them with? Um, you know, you know, for a while, and I think I might have heard you touch on this. It was just about hitting and, you know, letting the guys fail before you you made you made any adjustments. And it's. I've kind of changed my mind about that a little bit. You know, there's a saying it's um, be impatient for action, but patient for results. So it, it's tough to change a guy when you, when you first see him, but if, if you know it's wrong, there, there's ways and communications to go about it where you can show him video of other guys and this, that, and it kind of speeds up the learning curve. And I've, I've changed my mind on that just because, you know, I've had three weeks with these guys before a live AB and you saw stuff that wasn't going to work. Like you just, you just know, and just seeing from their past. So being able to, you know, be patient, like let them know, like, Hey, um, let's try this and just be patient with the results of it. And just overall communication on that has really, I've changed my mind on that a lot, honestly, because it's like, why would I just let you, let you fail. And I've had, you know, I got enough skin in the game right now where I came in and and the guys gave me a little more trust than you normally would, which is great. It's helped. It's helped me out sped up the coaching part of it. But uh, do you say something about a book? Any good books I've read? Yeah. Any, any books that you want uh, the coaches to read? Uh, I like the four agreements. Mm, That's a good one. That's not a that's not a that's not a coaching book. It's more of a life book. But there's a lot of I think a lot of things you can you can take from that book. And I'm actually going to read it again here soon. Um, there's not one specific thing in there that I like more than the other. It's just a it's a good feel good book. Put stuff into perspective. But mm-hmm. um, no, I mean it's just I think with hitting how it is nowadays, and and I've, I've changed a, a ton and when I first got into it, it's like, you felt like you had to do certain things because certain people were, and you had to use this technology because people said you should. And where for me, I've, I've been lucky where I've had a team of guys to handle the technology part for me, work with them, collaborate, take what I need. But at the end of the day, you talk to some of the best hitters in the game, the best recruits I have in this office, the best players, like, and that's why I say, like, I'm unapologetically simple because this game's so hard and I don't want to overcomplicate it. There's a time and a place, but in the end, you hear Mike Trout talk about hitting, you hear Nolan Arenado talk about hitting, Spencer Torkelson talk about hitting. Their approach, what they think, the things they do are extremely, extremely simple. And not saying that stuff out there that's a little different nowadays isn't right for certain people. But I think when you're dealing with the team, the team aspect of it, and, you know, I'm a hitting coach. I'm not a, I'm not a swing coach. You know, there, there's a difference. Like I'm, I'm coaching 20 players as opposed to a couple guys every few hours, which is mm-hmm. those guys do a really good job. And they, you know, I connect with a lot of those, you know, swing coach guys 
hitting private hitting coaches. It's it's a different aspect. You know what I mean? And, sure. and, and I don't, I don't shut those guys out at all. Like I think they, they bring a lot of value as long mm-hmm. as we're on the same page and they understand what I, what I'm doing isn't to cut down what they're doing. It's just the fact that I'm dealing with 20 guys as opposed to one or two at a time. So um, just, yeah. Can you hear the train? Going? Yeah. I love that. That's, that's a college station <laughs> classic right there. Yeah. Yeah, so. perfect into the show. Well, Mike, man, I it's always a pleasure, uh, and and looking forward to seeing the the impact that this makes and the impact that you make on your players. And uh, they're they're blessed, man. They're lucky to have you. And and thanks again for being on the show. No, I appreciate it, man. I, I'm just I'm lucky to be here and been very you know lucky in this game and love talking to you uh, about hitting or hitting in general. I hate talking about myself, but you talk about hitting or or my kids. I'll talk all day. So I just I appreciate you appreciate you having me on and. You're not too far away, so once you once you get out here, no doubt, no doubt, we'll have no to make doubt. a road trip. <laughs> All right, man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. See you, brother. When the time period that we're in, we're about to get to break, and then from there, it's like it's full steam ahead, right? So, tell us a little bit about what you what you guys are going to do preseason, and walk us through just kind of your process of getting guys ready for game one. Yeah, um, it's, it's a great question. If you have the answer, go ahead and we'll talk off air. You can give me some tips. Um, I, I think we talked about what we do with technology now. I think that's a big piece of it because um, now we have the results from the fall. And so you can kind of get into showing guys what they hit well, um, you know, where they where they have success, who they have success against, righties, lefties, to maybe certain arm slots, maybe certain pitches, whether guys are, you know, better against sliders or curveballs or whatever. Um, all those things, we now have information. Um, and then that becomes, you know, developing like that, that process of, uh, of creating a routine and creating a, an approach uh, for each individual guy. Um, and, and it's funny, like a bunch of guys have been kind of closing in on fall and, they're like, hey, are we gonna do two strike Tuesday in the spring? And I'm like, you bet we are. <laughs> We're, I'm not gonna run from this. Are you like, you guys are, are you scared of this? And they're like, no, 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 we want to do it. Because uh, I think sometimes we we get into this situation because we we make that mistake on the coaching side too, right? Of like, you make it hard in the fall, and then you get to the spring, and you're like, oh well, they're play, they're playing three, four times a week, sometimes five. Practice has got to be easy. And, you know, I'm like, no, we're just going to do the same things we've been doing. Uh, and I think just the more in-game adjustments are going to be what we talk about. And, uh, and this is always scary as a college coach because you're away from your guys from you know, six, seven weeks you know, starting in December. And you just hope that you've, you've done enough to to hopefully make them understand, like, what they need to do. Um, and – you know, you hope they come back ready to go. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. And, and so you said you guys this during this time, you guys are meeting with them. Uh, just mm-hmm. is it is it exit meetings to give them a plan to be able to, to move going forward through that break? Yeah. So we'll uh, I, I want to say that Monday or Tuesday we'll do we we'll do mobility, uh, like a movement screen at the beginning of fall, um, do it in the middle of fall. We'll do it at the end uh, just to kind of see, you know, how – how the, the wear and tear of the fall has affected their body because it's it's probably going to mirror what happens in the spring, right? Like it's going to be – you're probably going to move a little better in February than you will in June. Um, so we'll do that. And then we'll get into just the, the pure numbers. And and then you know, some take two minutes. And, hey, you did a great job. You know like what you do as a hitter and you have your routine and – work hard and I'll see on what is it January 12th or whatever it is. And there's other guys, you know, you kind of dive in and, and maybe for some young guys that that might not get many at bats for us this year. Now we really have those conversations. Cause that's one thing I won't do is like really, really make big adjustments with, with freshmen or first year guys that first fall. Um, because like I said, it goes back to the like bad swing, good hitter or, or good swing, bad hitter. Right. Like, I, you know, there might be some elements to somebody's swing that I don't like or we don't like, and but they hit 380 in the fall. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. we'll just keep doing that and make me look good, man. <laughs> and, no doubt. Um, 
so, you know, you get to those conversations of like, Hey, you're probably not going to play a whole lot. So it's time to like really make some adjustments. I think this will help. And, um, so it just kind of varies from guy to guy. Yeah, no doubt. I really like that. I always am curious, you know, what, what is talked about and you mentioned routines. So are you talking about, cause there's a lot of different aspects of routines. Is it mm-hmm. like yeah. they're, like they're getting ready for the game routines, their pre-pitch yeah. routines. Yeah. Dive into that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, all of it. Um, I think, you know, like you said, we could talk about this all day. I'm trying to like really, really dumb down like what we believe in here and and routine is one of them, but that's just about life, right? Like that's going to class, sitting in the front, um, eating right, getting enough sleep, um, going to, to see, you know, we have our, our academic support here is it, if one of the best, if not the best in the country, like, are you going to, to all your cats meetings, right? Are, are you getting your extra work in? Because like, I'll tell you, tell you what, like, I, we're only allowed a, a limited number of hours. Like if you're not doing stuff extra, like, and you want to talk about winning the national championship, like you're just lying to yourself. Right. So, do you have a routine that that gets you ready to practice? Do you have a routine at night to to help you sleep better? Um, and then you know, do you have a routine in the cages specifically that to work on something? Do you have a routine, um, you know, in the dugout when you're the sixth guy up? You know, are you a base dealer? Do you need to, you know, lock in and check in on some times of like seeing what this guy does with a runner at first, right? Um, are you a middle of the order guy? Are you gonna? Do you need to see like what he does with the runner and runner in scoring position. Does he like to get ahead with the fastball or does he like to go double breaking balls or, you know, all those things. And, um, and that's where I think, you know, being the translator in there really helps him. But I, I think you gotta, you gotta talk to those guys and help them understand that, you know, routine, you know, walking up to the plate and looking at your bat and like, that's only this really, really small element of a good routine. It's, you know, I shoot, I try to, have the same breakfast every day. Like I think routines are really, really important for me as an individual, but I think for players, they're, they're huge, especially in college. There's so many things on their plate and sure. um, with, with class and, and baseball and all that. They just, you know, I think the more prepared you are and the more organized you are, the more successful you're going to be. And that, and I think having a routine with all those is, is certainly really, really helpful. Well, tell us about, you know, your, your routine. Uh, I know that, that you haven't gotten to experience a spring in Tucson yet, but you have yep. gotten to experience some, <clears throat> some other springs in Sacramento and obviously yep. in pro ball and, and as a player, but tell us a little bit about, you know, as, as you now, like what has been a successful for you routine for you as a coach and what are you planning on doing moving forward to just be able to manage your time? You know, you're having a baby in April, which is going to yep. be amazing yeah. and congratulations Crazy. <laughs> thank but you but just like how how important are, are your routines too and uh, kind of what's what's been your process of being able to maximize your day with the maximum yeah. amount, amount of energy as possible yeah no i, I think uh, that's something that i th- i think i struggle with still to this day and and i tell our guys that like i, I think I think humility and vulnerability are important. So I try to, I'm, I'm pretty upfront and honest with them about, you know, not being good at stuff. And, um, I, I try to, as best I can get into the office around the same time every day. I, I try to, to have my routine in the morning in terms of like, um, you know, I, I kind of oversee our camps also. So I, I have that morning of like spend an hour or two of just checking different things on that. Uh, on that end and, and sending out emails and, and doing, doing stuff like that. And then I'll have the, you know, an hour or two where I am I'm ready for practice and I, I'm, I'm trying to organize the day, what our groups are going to be, what are we doing? What's our progression going to be? Um, and then there's, you know, a couple of times a week I try to get in there and really watch film. So I, it's not that I give guys information every day, but I want to be well armed when, when they do come with that, with that conversation, uh, of, you know, Hey, what do you see? I, I don't want to be like, well, let me go watch film. Um, I try to stay up with everybody. Um, there's just a lot of elements in, in the, it, throughout the day and, and, you know, having 19 hitters, I trying to stay on that. And so, you know, they'll, I'll go through a list of guys that I'll, I'll go watch and then, you know, 
our director of player development, Tyler Coolbaz, he's awesome. Like he's, he's way smarter than I am. And, and he is a great, great, great understanding of the swing. Um, so he makes me look, look good most of the time. That's, um, but we sit down and we'll talk about guys and, and trying to create a plan. Um, and then practice uh, is try to be the same every day. And then, and I think for me, you know, we have Chip's such a high energy guy and he's, he's awesome. Um, where I think at the beginning, I thought that might be kind of who I had to be, um, where I, I can kind of be the guy who I don't need to like bring high energy every day, which is awesome. I think as a hitting coach, you need to really be even keel. Um, so I try to, I try to, um, create that in every aspect uh, of my daily habits. So it was just trying to stay the same. I love that, man. And, you know, with, with routines and, and trying to, to decide, you know, how you're going to spend your time is, well, time is the, is the most important resource mm-hmm. we have. And so yeah. just being able to do that. But before you go, yeah. I know we, <laughs> we've been, we go a little long. We, we said, we'll probably talk all afternoon. That's it. Yeah, before we'll you go, go for I, <laughs> forever. Oh yeah. Always, man. Always. But, uh, I'd love to hear just anything, any advice that you have for coaches out there. It could be young guys getting in or something that you've learned lately or just any yeah. interesting nuggets, books, yeah. you know, podcast, what, any and everything that you feel like you would love to, to leave with our listeners on, hey, this is something that might not work for everybody, work for me, but here's some different yeah. things that I found to help me be more successful. Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, I... It's a hard question. I would say just be authentic and and show great humility and and be vulnerable. I think that's um, I think the most powerful thing you can say to to your players. And and I said I hate to be unarmed, but I, but I also think there's a lot of there's a lot of value in saying I don't know um, because if you say I don't know and then you have an answer an hour later or a day later um, that just told your player that, that you, you wanted to learn and you wanted to get better. And so when you're asking them to learn and, and maybe make a change, they know that you're willing to do that because I I don't think, um, you know, I'll, I'll use chip as an example, like why I love working for him is like, you know, I'll walk out of the cages and, and he's watering the field. That guy's been, you know, in coaching in the big leagues for years and years and years, and he's sitting there watering the field for us. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of goes to that point of, like, don't ever ask someone to do something that you wouldn't be willing to do. Um, so just be authentic and, and work really, really hard. And, um, you know, for me, I think oftentimes you see people trying to get to know every, anyone and everyone just to – enlarge their network. And that's never really been super important to me. I just think being authentic has been the the number one, because I think when you, you create relationships, they're more genuine and organic. Um, And then I, I guess the, uh, as far as advice, I think coach Savage said this at the 2017 or 18 convention. Um, I think him, um, who was it that were you there? It was the him, um, Maneri like and the head coaches panel. Yeah, it was him, Maneri and Corbin, I think, right? Mm-hmm. Coach Corbin. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, know where everything is. And that always kind of stuck with me, right? Know how to do everything, know how to turn off the sprinklers, mm-hmm. um, know where the hoses are, know where the drags are. Um, so know where everything is. That, that was that, that always kind of hit home with me. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a rating or review wherever you are listening. I also wanted to remind you that you can find the video portion at the AOTC channel on stickandball.tv. Have a great week.